Praise God. Jesus, use me. Hallelujah. One night in a church service, a young woman felt the tug of God upon her heart. She responded to God's call, obeyed the gospel of Jesus, was baptized in his name, and received the Holy Ghost. The young woman had a very rough past involving alcohol, drugs, and prostitution. But the change in her was evident. As time went on, she became a faithful member of the church. She eventually became involved in the ministry, teaching young children. And it was not long till this faithful young woman caught the eye and the heart of the pastor's son. The relationship grew, and they began to make wedding plans. And that's when the problems began. Hope you all are hearing my story. See, about one half of the church did not think that the woman with a past such as hers was suitable for a pastor's son. And so the church began to argue and fight about the matter. And finally, they decided to have a church meeting. As the people made their arguments and tensions increased, the meeting was getting completely out of hand. The young woman became very upset about all the things that being brought up about her past. And as she began to cry, the pastor's son stood up to speak. He could not bear the pain it was causing this young lady, his wife, to be. He began to speak, and his statement was this. My fiancé's past is not what is on trial here. What you are questioning is the ability of the blood of Jesus to wash away sin. Today, you have put the blood of Jesus on trial. So I ask, does it wash away sin or not. The whole church began to weep as they realized that they had been slandering the blood of Jesus Christ. Too often, even as Christians, we bring up the past and use it as a weapon against our brothers and sisters. Forgiveness is a very foundational part of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm just going to tell you, the church can't grow if you're a stinky, nasty gossip. The blood of Jesus doesn't cleanse the other person completely. Then neither can it completely cleanse you. And if that is the case, we are all in a lot of trouble. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank the Lord. Amen. Apostle Paul wrote and he said, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. To some, to those who perish, to those who are lost, preaching is foolishness. But to those of you who are saved, preaching is the power of God. And this It's why the devil wants you to doubt the preacher and doubt his preaching. I heard it said about me many years ago. Well, I would be preaching strongly. And they would talk about when Brother Kenny got mad while he was preaching. You know, I've heard that very same comment about Pastor Phil. I hope that never comes out of the mouth of any of you. Hallelujah. Because if so, you have no understanding at all. Because the devil wants you to doubt the preacher and his preaching. Verse 19, Paul continues, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? And where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God. I want you to read that last part with me. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 21. God has a plan. And no matter what anybody says... No matter what the world says, no matter what the church world says, God's plan includes going to church and hearing the preaching. 
It pleased God that through preaching, people will be saved. We must preach a lost world out of hell. And that is the title of my message tonight. Preach them out of hell. Hallelujah. <clears throat> you need to know that the devil has centuries of practice. Amen. Now, I, I'm 69 years old. Where's Sister Mary? There she is. She's the oldest one here. Just turned 90. Next Sunday evening, there's going to be a, a birthday party for Mary. Turning 90. But as old as she is, the devil has a lot more years of practice deceiving people into not believing and not obeying. Yes, there are new tactics for every generation. And yet, yes, Satan still uses his old, tested, and tried tactics to turn people away from God. So we must preach them out of hell. Amen. I need your help tonight. I need you to hear this message because I need you. You need, God needs you to help preach them out of hell. The world is still deceived by sin and Satan. And we need to take this generation away from the devil. Now, Peter wrote about the end of those people who do not obey the word. 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Please don't think that the devil has or that the Lord has a blanket plan and for everybody who ever walked into a church that they're going to be saved or anybody that ever said, I believe. There is obedience that is necessary. Can you understand? There is a decided and definite end to them who do not obey the gospel of Jesus. Can I tell you this evening that your obedience is more powerful than your prayer meeting. Your obedience is more powerful than your prayer meeting. What does the Bible say then that the end will be of those who obey not the gospel of Jesus? And we find that answer in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7. And he said, to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Can I remind you that there is a day that Jesus is coming back to this earth again to bring judgment upon the disobedient of this world, to bring judgment upon those who are not obedient to the gospel of Jesus. Thank you very, very much. I'm not sure why my mouth is so dry tonight. He said... In the next verse, verse 8, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. So the Lord Jesus, verse 7 again, when Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, verse 8, in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I tell you the word is very plain and very strong about obedience to the gospel. Nine, the next verse. They will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So verse eight and nine tells us that those who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. And if God chose preaching to save people, then we must preach them out of hell and if God is this serious if he is going to destroy them with everlasting destruction those who do not obey the gospel then I'm going to tell you that it's time that we get involved personally in reaching Jesus in reaching people for Jesus so that they can be saved while they still have time can somebody say amen Hallelujah. 
for you who are just playing church and for you who are looking for an excuse to skip a service and for you who talk all the time during the service and the preaching I want you to know you need to get busy and preach somebody out of hell hallelujah we're not just killing time waiting for the trumpet of God to sound we've got a work to do the percentage of people who believe the gospel is less every year. People need to hear the gospel. And we ask them, how are, there, how are they going to hear the gospel? Well, they will because there's something we must do. 2 Corinthians 4 and 1. Seeing that we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. My friend, we have this ministry. I want you to say that line with me. We have this ministry. Say it again. We have this ministry. It's not just the preacher, but you're preaching a word from the Lord. Every day you get in your car and you drive down the highway and you go to the grocery store and you go to the restaurant and you go somewhere. Friend, you are preaching a message. As we have received mercy... We have received mercy, so we must minister to others, and we must extend mercy. I believe that Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7, and I didn't give that to David, but he said, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. My friend, it's time for you to have mercy for the lost. It's time for you to have mercy for the sinner. It's time for you to have mercy for the backslider. It's time for you to have mercy for the teenager that acts a little bit unruly. God, help us today to have mercy so so that we can have mercy for ourselves. Verse 2. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness. Nor handling the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth. Commending ourselves to every man's conscience. In the sight of God. We are not dishonest with the gospel. We got to preach the truth. We got to know the truth. So we can preach the truth. So we can live the truth. Nor do we use the word of God deceitfully for our own gain. Oh God help us. We must be honest and we must be truthful. The next verse says if our gospel be hid. It is hid to them that are lost. My friend there's a lot of people all around us. A lot of people in this community. There is about one fifth of this community that goes to church. That means there's about four fifths that do not go to church anywhere. And the gospel is hidden to them. We need to open their eyes with the love of Jesus Christ through us. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ who is the image of God should shine through them. So the God of this world. Anybody know who the God of this world? Can you see that first line? Whom the God of this world. You notice that God is a little g. That means it's not talking about God Jehovah. It's not talking about Jireh. It's not talking about Jesus the Almighty. He's not talking about that God, but he's talking about a devil. He's talking about a God of this world that is not real or true deity. And he's blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. The God of this world, the enemy of our soul, has blinded people so they cannot see the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. And I pray that God would reveal his gospel to this lost world we must preach Jesus to this world we've got to live Jesus before this world we've got to stand for Jesus and live for Jesus in this world so that they can see Jesus in us hallelujah for we preach not ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus sake You've probably heard me say over the years as we pray, prepare to baptize someone. 
And I will say, we're not baptizing them in the name of, uh, of Brother Kenny. And we're not baptizing them in the name of Pastor Phil. And we're not baptizing them in the name of President. And I will use whatever president is in office at that time. Uh, well, the reason we're not, my friend, is we're baptizing them in the name of Jesus. Um, hallelujah. We're not preaching me and we're not preaching Pastor Phil. Uh, but you need to trust your leadership as long as they're in the Word. Um, but we are preaching. Um, we are preaching Jesus. We are not the Savior for anybody. We are preaching Christ Jesus the Lord. He is the answer to this lost world, and we must preach the lost out of hell. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. This is verse 6. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What a treasure that we have. What a treasure that we have. The treasure of God. We have the Holy Ghost within us. We have a ministry. We have an opportunity. We have a ministry to preach hope to a hopeless world. Hallelujah. Amen. So I'm going to ask it to you this way. Now I know some of you came to the Lord here in this church. And, and you were raised under my ministry. But I wonder, what I'm going to ask you, uh, did anybody start coming because you were invited by somebody who was not a preacher? Hallelujah. I need you to stand. Hallelujah. You were invited by somebody who was not a preacher. Who was not a preacher? Somebody who was not a preacher. So, All right. Boomer and Kathy, I think you were invited by Nancy, probably. I worked on you afterwards, but <laughs> hallelujah. So you see all these. So you, I'm not just talking about preachers. Hallelujah. I'm not just talking about preachers because you have a ministry. Somebody reached you who was. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness shined in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power of God be of power may be of God and not of us. So this treasure of God, the Holy Ghost in us, is a ministry to give hope to a hopeless world. God has given us a powerful, positive ministry with a wonderful message of hope. Thank you to the sound team that helped, that helped us out right there. We must preach Jesus so people can be delivered from an eternity with Satan. The world needs a church that's on fire with the power of God. The world is becoming more sinful each day. Sin, crime, hatred, and evil is waxing worse and worse. May the church be the church. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The world has a negative, quitting spirit. The problem of alcohol and drugs among men, women, and teenagers is a horrible problem that continues to get worse every day. The world is getting worse and not better. Sin is rampant all over this world. But Jesus is the answer, and the world needs to hear about Jesus. July 3rd of this year, I'll be preaching downtown in the Canton Christian Church. You can begin to pray now that God will help me to say something that will touch somebody's life that will forever change their eternity. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So for us to have faith, we need to hear the word of God preached. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Verse 14, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed, and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard, and how shall they hear without a preacher? Say the last part without me. And how shall they hear without a preacher? Say it again. And how shall they hear without a preacher? The world needs preachers who will preach. And preachers need people who will hear. Hallelujah. Verse 15, they shall preach. And how shall they preach except they be sent? 
as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Can I say that God will call you, every one of you, and send you to minister to somebody? Will you go to them and teach them the gospel? You may never stand behind the sacred desk to deliver a sermon. You may not, not have a microphone in your hand and have the PA system go crazy and wild on you. Hallelujah. But you can teach somebody. You can reach somebody. You can love somebody. You can minister to somebody. We, the believers, must get beyond our troubles and our quarrels, our differences and our hang-ups, and reach a lost and dying world. Our problems that we have do not compare with the sin sickness of this world. Their sin will cause them to be lost. It will damn them forever to a devil's hell. Hallelujah. So you got to understand, I've been here long enough. I remember, I remember that Karen came from the world. And Jesus filled her with the Holy Ghost and we baptized her in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. I'm thankful for that. Praise God. I'm thankful for Dalton and Sarah. Amen. Because I remembered when they weren't living for God, but they are now involved in Sunday school. Hallelujah. I remember when Corey and Rachel, and he's a licensed minister of the United Pentecostal Church now, but I remember when they were not serving God or living for God at all. And, and I remember when Corey had a terrible, terrible potty mouth that he always controlled around me. Your daughter would tell on you. <laughs> Hallelujah. And we could go around the room talking about, I remember when you were not, but you are today. You're living for God. God has changed your life. He's called you. Uh, he's delivered you from sin. Uh, does that mean you're perfect? No, but I'm going to tell you that every one of you have a past. Uh, every one of us has a yesterday. Everybody, everybody has sin in their closet that is really, it's under the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As a preacher, I'm not in a popularity contest. Sometimes I forget that I should be a little bit more because I open my mouth and just say stuff. But I'm not really in a popularity, popularity contest. You and I have been given the word of reconciliation. We've got to preach the lost out of hell. We've got to preach deliverance, salvation, and hope to this lost generation. No matter how much sin they live in, Jesus wants to save them. Hallelujah. No matter how much sin they lived in, Jesus wants to save them. I'm going to tell you, if we started, and we're not going to, but if we went around the room and every, had everybody name all of their sin, you would be shocked at everybody's background hallelujah Jesus walked in this earth and he raised people from the dead the degree of their death made no difference to Jesus Jarius had a 12 year old daughter who had just died and Jesus showed up and Jesus raised her from the dead the widow's son in Luke 7 had been dead for a day when Jesus arrived in that city and Jesus raised that young man from the dead. They were in their funeral procession on their way to the cemetery to bury him. And Jesus raised him from the dead. Lazarus had been dead for four days, but Jesus called him out of the tomb and raised him up. So it doesn't matter how long they have been in the hold of sin, Jesus can and will raise them up. Amen. No matter how bad it seems that some people were, no matter the depth of their sin, no matter how long they've been a sinner, let's preach to them the hope of Jesus Christ. Let's preach them out of hell. Let's give them hope where they had no hope before hallelujah did you just write this sermon this afternoon brother Kenny no this is what I was going to preach the last time and we had worship and prayer and singing and worship and prayer and I didn't get to preach hallelujah praise God but I did work on it some more yesterday in preparation for today hallelujah doesn't matter how long they've been there Jesus wants to save them hallelujah we're going to preach him out of hell I'm going to bring it down a little bit more personal for you. 
One thing that makes Pentecost what it is is the preaching. Preaching. It's powerful of preaching. Anointed preaching like the apostles preached. And it's different from all others. There's a powerful anointing in Pentecostal preaching. There's authority when an apostolic believe in Jesus' name. Holy Ghost filled preacher preaches the word of God. And we need preaching that gives a sure and a certain sound. Now, again, I'm not just preaching a message to preachers. I haven't taken this whole sermon to preach to, to uh, David and Eric and, and uh, Corey and the ministers in training. I'm preaching to the church, to the saints of God, the members of the body of Christ. Hallelujah. But here's, here's my point tonight, folks. You're preaching a louder message than I am, and I've got the microphone. Your response, hear me? Your response or your lack of response to preaching is mighty clear. Your attitude in the church, your attitude in the church, your prayer and your worship is preaching a message to people who need Jesus. What you do during the service, you're preaching a message. It's time for the saints to get behind the pulpit. And when Allison says on Sunday morning, let's everybody gather around the front, even Tommy, who just had a heart attack and came out of the hospital just a few days ago, got up from the front, got up from the front pew and came up here. Hallelujah. It's time for the saints to get behind the pulpit and the preacher and time to get behind the preaching. It's time to get behind every program in the church. Hallelujah. I remember there was a man that used to come to church here. He'd come in late, and he would leave early. And then he would complain to me about clicks in the church, and he wasn't able to get involved. My friend, if you want to get involved, why don't you come early and stay late? Get around the altar and pray with people. When the sinner comes in, they're going to look at all you people to see how the congregation responds to the preacher and the preaching. And if the sinner sees that you believe what the preacher is preaching, you may be more convincing than the preacher is. But if you sit back there and you never respond to the preacher, and I don't know what's wrong with you that you never respond to the preacher anyhow. Hallelujah. But if you sit back there and you never respond to the preacher, I just want to tell you, you know what you're telling everybody else? You don't have to because I'm not going to. I don't believe this. And you don't have to believe it either. I taught for years when we were down at 412 College Street. When we give an altar call, everybody come to the altar. Because then the guest, the person who's never repented, the person who is a sinner and doesn't know about Jesus, they're going to look around and say, well, everybody else is going up front. I might as well go, go up front too. And the, the truth is more people receive the Holy Ghost around an apostolic Pentecostal altar rather than anybody else or anywhere else. Tell me, my friend, where did you receive the Holy Ghost? I almost guarantee you for the majority of you it was around an altar. When the invitation is given, the bishop says, you ought to come up to the front. Maybe your feet hurt. Mine don't right now, but I promise you, when church is over and I get home, I'm going to go, oh, God, I hurt so bad. There's only about two or three people here older than me. Rebecca Putt. <laughs> it's not in my notes. <laughs> I love you. you. You're feeling it. What's your name? Joe. And these three ladies right here, they're older than I am. One, two, three. <laughs> One, no. <laughs> Even Leland is not. He, I know he looks old enough to be my dad, but he's not as old as I am. <laughs> Close. <laughs> when I go to a restaurant or someplace with Bill, I, I always introduce him. This is my dad. Yeah. <laughs> Your response, I, I'm 69 years old. I, I promise you that when I get home tonight, my bones, my body is going to be weary. I'm going to have some aches and pains. 
I've been taking a nap in afternoons now. I, I don't even know why. I've gone to the doctor because I think something is wrong with me. And she said, it's because you keep having birthdays. <laughs> well, I don't want to quit that. <laughs> Thank you. If a sinner sees that you believe what the preacher's preaching, you might be more convincing that the preacher is than the preacher is. You need church, you need to sing like heaven is dependent on you. Amen. You need to use your voice and sing. You need to sing because you know the soul of the sinner depends on you. You need to pray like somebody prayed for you because your prayer will make an eternal difference in somebody else's life. Hallelujah. What you're doing right now is reaching, preaching lost people out of hell. And if you're not doing anything, you're letting them alone to go to a lake of fire to be lost for eternity. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful worship tonight. I'm so thankful for that. I was glad to see our young people up here singing and worshiping the Lord. But I looked over here, and I don't know where this little bench was or the stool was sitting. But I looked up here, and there was a beautiful little girl sitting up here singing singing, singing. You know what I want them to do? I want them to sing until they're a teenager. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm going to tell you, teenagers, I'm, I'm going to tell you, Nazela, I love it when you sing because I believe that God has a calling on your heart and, and you're singing. Amen. It's a testimony. It's one thing when the old man sings, but it's another thing when they see a teenager singing and worshiping the Lord and praising God. Friend, you can preach them out of hell by what you're doing in a church service. Bob, it's time for you to get off the front row and start worshiping God. I'm 25 years older than you are. Nobody's going to correct that math, are they? <laughs> oh, 11. Bob corrected me. 11. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I pray that God will give us a revelation. I, I'm going to try to get done here. Let you see that everyone, let, let every one of you will see that you have a ministry. Your lost family is dependent on you to preach them out of hell with your love and your godly life. Preach them out of hell with your prayer. Preach them out of hell with your worship. Hallelujah. Preach them out of hell with your response to the preaching from the pulpit. I don't know whether you know or not, but Mark Tarpon got married. We should have a reception sometime. Who did he get married to? We're still trying to figure that one out. Uh, so Mark has moved to Cahoka, to the ends of the earth. And he works in Quincy. He didn't change jobs because he has a good job. How long is your drive to work, Brother Mark? About an hour. I don't know if he does this every day, all the time, all the way. But I've heard him say and I've heard him tell others that, that he puts his Bible app on through the radio of the car and he listens to the Bible an hour on the way to work and an hour on the way home. I'm going to tell you, God's going to do something because he's going to honor his word. Hallelujah. I I've already noticed that Faye is acting nicer and sweeter. Just keep up the good work, Mark. <laughs> Hallelujah. Aliana, I might need another glass of water. <sighs> the message you preach by your response in church is either sending them to hell or your response is preaching them a message of hope. I want everybody, I hope people listen to this and that they hear the message about Mark listening to his Bible on the way to work and it convicts some heart and they start listening to their Bible 
the message you preach by your lifestyle will make an eternal difference in somebody's life. I know, I know I'm crazy sometimes uh, in the pulpit and out of the pulpit. I just, you never know uh, what, my, what I might say. And, uh, did somebody say amen? <laughs> but we can make a difference. I know, as crazy as I am, that I've made a difference in people's lives. I, I've made a difference in Pastor Phil's life. Not because I preached the devil out of him all the time, but because I loved him. I loved him. I loved him. I'm making a difference in Odie's life. Did you have a baby already? Whose baby is that? Oh, that's I, Isaiah. Isaac. I know I got two pair of glasses because I don't have, I don't have trifocals. These are my computer glasses so I can see my words, but then I can't see your faces very clearly out there. It might be a good thing. Thank you, Ollie. 1 Corinthians 6 and 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, and neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with men. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. I just am old enough to know, and I've been around here enough to know, and I know some of you well enough, that many of you have fit some of those sins. And God is very specific and plain about people in sin not inheriting the kingdom of God. But in the next verse, Jesus gives us hope. <clears throat> Amen. We're going to have sinners come in that are a lot worse sinners than you all. We better love them. And God's very specific and plain about people in sin not inheriting the kingdom of God. But your unforgiveness is a nasty sin. But in the next verse, Jesus gives us hope, and he says, And such were some of you. Hallelujah. But you are washed, you are sanctified, you are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Oh, hallelujah to the Lord. Such were some of you. Your husbands, you used to be, but now you're washed, you're sanctified, you're justified in the name of the Lord and by the Spirit of our God. Hallelujah. You've been where the lost were, are. You know the answer. You've been delivered. You know what they need. Will you help us preach them out of hell? We cannot let the devil tie us up and stop us until we're no longer able to minister to somebody else. We need to get beside ourselves for your lost family and your lost friends. You need to get passionate about seeing your family saved. Let's get passionate about our friends coming to Jesus before it's everlasting too late. We got to give faith and hope when they have no hope. It's too many people think they can't. Sister Allison, what a marvelous message again this morning. She said, I didn't feel like it was even doing anything. It was so hard. But I told her, I said, the response showed. And, and I've preached and preached and preached. And sometimes there was not even a good response. But you had one this morning. We know that people can do something for God. Hallelujah. They can live for God. Hallelujah. Amen. Donna Hathaway's mother. Francis. Francis Pree. She's the one who reached Janet. Lippincott and brought Janet to church and I'm going to tell you this old lady I love her very very much sister Janet because she loves other people she prays and she cares amen she can't even hear half your gossip I said she's hard of hearing and she can't hear half your gossip But you know what? She trusts this old preacher. 
because I was her pastor when she came into the Lord about 37, 36, 37, 38 years ago. Hallelujah. And Janet is passing on the legacy that Francis gave her. Loving people, kindness, prayer, ministry. Hallelujah. Tegan, I finally remembered what your name is. Tegan, I know what your name is too. We have two of them in the church. Hallelujah. But every time I would ask the older Tegan what her name was, she'd say, Tegan. I said, oh, yes, yes. I, how could I forget? Well, I'm, I'm starting to remember. I want Tegan to know, and I want Tegan to know that this church loves them and that the preachers love them. Hallelujah. And they can live for Jesus. I've got one more paragraph if you want to come to the keyboard. So let's preach them out of hell by our singing. Let's preach them out of hell by our worship. Let's preach them out of hell by our faith. Let's preach them out of hell by our response to the Spirit. Let's preach them out of hell by our preaching, by, by our preaching, and then let's preach them out of hell by our response to the preaching. Does anybody ever remember hearing this message before? There's one over here. Landon, you don't remember. Jessica does. Sister. You do. You know what? I've preached this message, message 10 times in this church beginning in 1985. But it's brand new people who weren't here in 1985. Or the last time I preached it was 2015, September 13th, 2015. What I want you to do is you become involved in preaching them out of hell by your life that is lived for Jesus Christ. Would you stand as the music plays and would you come to this altar? <clears throat> Make a commitment to Jesus. Jesus, use me. Jesus, use me.